crisis from human development perspective. Uh, <coughs> Basically, I didn't want to uh, call this uh, slide an outline, but it is an outline of what we'll be talking. A uh, few major things. One, uh, to go beyond the traditional narrative on the crisis, because at least I have the feeling that we're still not there yet in terms of uh, understanding what it's all about, what are the crisis determinants, and what could be the uh, ways out. Why it is important? Uh, because. I'm afraid sometimes that uh, uh, the measures which are now being taken are very ad hoc, uh, addressing some short-term implications, and uh, may have, uh, in fact, uh, negative uh, uh, impact in the long run. So mm -hmm. this is one of the hypotheses, so we'll discuss it during, uh, during the, uh, today's session. Also, uh, uh, I would like to discuss uh, the issue of overproduction, because, in fact, the crisis is not something unique. Uh, from certain perspective. Uh, it is very often being compared uh, to the uh, 1929 and the recession in the 30s, uh, uh, also started in the US, but uh, in fact affecting the entire global economy at that time. Uh, and in this matter, it is uh, also typical uh, uh, example of overproduction uh, fueled uh, by expansion of so-called fiduciary money, money based on trust. But uh, it has certain specifics uh, which uh, uh, makes this crisis unique and, in fact, uh, determines uh, the fact that we don't actually know what exactly happens, what is the scale and the magnitude of what happens. And I think one of the important issues is a temp temporal shift, the borrowing age of consumption, which will be, I would suggest to um, uh, discuss as well. Uh, also, the so-called uh, relationship between growth in uh, developing economies, in particular China, and the crisis uh, is something which starts now. It was not at the, last, uh, at, at the end of the uh, last year uh, very evident, but it's increasingly being focused uh, in the discussion on the crisis. And, of course, the uh, magical question, where is the money? Uh, where has all the money gone, which somehow were there last year and were not there now? So we'll talk about this. A uh, few minutes. So the evolution of the issue. I think it's very important to bear in mind uh, because it's not just linguistic. We have uh, a terminological evolution, we have evolution of the focus, and a certain conceptual evolution, which is now still in process. Terminologically, if you remember, uh, the crisis was uh, presented and perceived primarily at the beginning as uh, a mortgage crisis in the US. Later, by the uh, end of uh, last year, it uh, turned into financial crisis. And it took uh, several months, I think around uh, February this year, uh, the uh, dominant uh, perception of the crisis is economic crisis uh, start gaining uh, uh, ground. And I think it's not uh, just uh, terminological evolution because it reflects certain conceptualization of the issue. Uh, from a more narrow sector-related pr perspective to a broader uh, approach to the phenomenon. Uh, I think it's important to understand, at least uh, I think it's crucial, uh, for the simple reason that uh, theoretically, Balish can correct me if I'm wrong, but theoretically you can have uh, 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 financial crisis uh, within a sound uh, uh, economical basis but you can't have uh, the other way around. So uh, unless you have uh, sound economic basis, uh, even if uh, the financial system looks uh, apparently uh, in a healthy state, uh, this state would be very debatable. So this transition from perceiving the crisis from financial to economic, I think is crucial in uh, crafting the responses because the responses so far were mostly focused on the financial sector with the idea that it will uh, somehow follow and impact uh, the real economy. Uh, the conceptual part is also related to the um, issues of economic cycles. Uh, one of the schools of thought uh, claims that, in fact, this is something normal. And indeed, uh, we have uh, um, economic cycles uh, very well described in economic history. It's not just this crisis I mentioned, not just the crisis of the 30s, but uh, in between, uh, we had between uh, 14 and 15 different uh, crises of bigger or smaller magnitude with bubbles uh, being inflated and burst. But uh, the real question here is what is uh, the uh, center of gravity? Is it the cycle which determines uh, the, the magnitude of the crisis or there is something beyond which 
coincides and uh, determines somehow the depth of the cycle. This graph illustrates several of the points and uh, it shows uh, the global GDP growth. It is IMF data uh, by three uh, type of groups. So generally the world, which is in the blue line, uh, the advanced economies in red and uh, the emerging market and uh, developing economies, uh, this uh, orange or yellow, yellow line. And what we he see here is uh, a very interesting phenomenon on the one hand of the perception of the crisis and on the other expected uh, uh, ways out. If you look at the trends uh, dramatically falling down at the end of the uh, last year and uh, uh, IMF experts expect that it will actually uh, stabilize uh, um, and started uh, increasing uh, uh, in the 2009 automatically projecting uh, that this trend would uh, catch up and uh, continue and the world will uh, come back more or less to the same pattern uh, which we see on the left side of this, of this decline. Uh, I think this is uh, important exactly as an illustration of the uh, certain conceptual uh, pattern. And uh, the pattern is simple. What we had and what we have now is something which, yes, comes and goes. And we can relatively easy, relatively, with enormous amount of resources being poured in, but still come back to the uh, business as usual. This is my interpretation of this graph. Personally, I'm, I'm very skeptical about this, but uh, I would like to discuss this with you and uh, with other colleagues. Uh, to what extent the right side from the decline is feasible and to what extent the proportions which we have will be the same as uh, we have and uh, the relative weight of different uh, uh, geographical uh, economic uh, blocks, regions and so on will play the role that they expected to play. Why I'm questioning this? Because uh, actually uh, this is a projection and uh, so far we have uh, witnessed uh, uh, constant trend in the last half a year or even last nine months uh, of deteriorating uh, uh, perspectives or projections in terms of GDP forecasts. Uh, in October 2008, the forecast for our region was within reduced growth, but still within the positive margin of roughly 3%. Then it was revised in February, then it was revised in June, and now we have minus 5.1% anticipated growth. I'm not sure to what extent in three months we will not uh, have something, something uh, worse. For Central Europe, it's minus uh, 3.7. And of course, uh, part of this uh, mm, story is related to the appearing, uh, the so-called green shoots and uh, uh, the emerging signs that the manufacturing is, mm, is catching up, that consumer mm, uh, demand is increasing. But what I think is overestimated is the short-term uh, impact of the economic stimulus. Uh, we try to find data, uh, aggregated data, on what is the amount of this stimulus being poured in the economies. I mean, but there are still fragmented uh, pieces of information. Uh, $787 billion is the US stimulus package. But uh, more or less uh, comparable to the size uh, amounts uh, being invested or being spent by other uh, governments of uh, most developed economies. And the trick in uh, assessing this uh, value is not just uh, to put uh, together the numbers, but also mm, to track what kind of uh, uh, amount, what kind of resources being invested, how, because some of this goes as uh, uh, support for the financial sector, some of it goes as uh, uh, support of uh, direct or indirect of the, the real economy, employment creation, and so on and so forth. But roughly, I think we will be on the safe side to claim that uh, uh, between two and two and a half trillion dollars are being poured into the uh, global economy. And of course, you can uh, expect that once you have certain injection, uh, that scale of resources, you will have uh, the so-called green shoots. To what extent those green shoots will catch up and will grow into sustainable uh, uh, development and sustainable uh, restoration of the levels of GDP is still an open issue. But one of the interpretations uh, which I think is uh, um, worth considering about uh, the data of IMF uh, 
is the perspective uh, of the uh, growth uh, rates in Central Europe and CIS countries, also in, the, in other region, but in this case I'm uh, interested more in this uh, region, which claims that uh, despite uh, the differences or whatever the magnitude of the uh, uh, recovery and uh, the depths of the recession will be, we can expect and we will most probably ex uh, uh, witness a second uh, post-transition shock. If you remember, we were talking about this uh, last week. During the uh, first period of transition, there was sharp decline of uh, GDP and other development uh, indicators. And gradually, the countries were catching up and restoring this uh, uh, pre-transition level. It took different countries, different between 10 and sometimes 14 years. Some of the countries have not restored it still. And uh, uh, we may witness similar, maybe shorter in terms of uh, time span, but similar shocks in all the countries uh, of our region. So for Central and Eastern Europe, uh, it would take roughly uh, until 2012 to restore the pre-crisis GDP levels. And for CIS countries, uh, until 2011 and uh, Russia 2012. We are not alone in this, and uh, some countries like uh, Italy, Spain, and UK will not restore their uh, levels of uh, GDP before 2015. But even if uh, it uh, is restored uh, uh, faster than we anticipate in this pessimistic scenario, it is not just about GDP, it's also what kind of growth. And uh, we, have this, uh, we have this in our uh, online module, the differences between uh, uh, human development, centered and focused growth and just growth. And uh, just to remind what we uh, already know, there is, of course, two ways connection uh, between growth and GDP, of GDP and human development. On the one hand, growth indeed provides resources necessary for all the other uh, human development areas. I mean, this is clear. And on the other hand, improvement in uh, health status, educational level, participation uh, of, uh, of the society and so on, also uh, play as an important factor in terms of GDP growth itself. But what we know, and it was very clearly uh, outlined in one of the reports which uh, UNDP published in 96, not any kind of growth is uh, uh, advisable and is uh, beneficial from human development perspective. And this report uh, outlined five types of uh, uh, unfavorable growth. Jobless, which uh, is uh, not related uh, to increase of uh, employment opportunities. Ruthless, uh, which is um, uh, uh, benefiting uh, mostly the rich, so the fruits of the growth go just to the rich. Uh, voiceless, which is just imposed on the people without any participation opportunities. Ruth, rootless, which is a, at the expense of local cultures, local identity, and uh, kind of McDonald's uh, type of uh, growth. And futureless growth, uh, which is, comes at the expense of the future generation, either directly uh, indebting, uh, like we had uh, in our region uh, before the crisis, uh, with huge increase in uh, foreign uh, debt, which is later was passed uh, on to the next generations, or through the uh, natural resources which uh, can be squandered for the purposes of current uh, consumption and current growth. I highlighted in red the two uh, specific issues, jobless and futureless, because I think uh, it is something which is very much related to today's crisis. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there is evidence that even if those green shoots uh, survive, uh, most probably they will be rather in the scope of the jobless growth. So we cannot expect that this uh, uh, catching up uh, with the GDP will have the similar uh, impact in terms of employment opportunities and related incomes of households, uh, possibilities of uh, uh, household uh, living standards and so on. And the futureless growth is also a very important thing because uh, one of the uh, characteristics of the pre-crisis uh, economic model was extremely uh, huge and ex fast expansion of credit. And uh, as I mentioned, this fiduciary money is very much related to the uh, fundamentals, I think, to the economic crisis. Why? Because uh, it is simply uh, the way to get higher uh, rates of growth. 
the traditional model of uh, economic growth, which is based on savings, I mean, takes time. You need to accumulate savings, which later to invest. But you can shortcut this, uh, this, pers this uh, uh, longer path and uh, uh, base uh, uh, the economic model on uh, uh, expansion of credit. And this graph illustrates, to a certain extent, this, this point. And you see the blue line, which is the industrial uh, output, industrial production, and the red line is uh, uh, the credit uh, to the real sector. And you see how in the period of uh, relatively uh, 2005 until 2008, there was uh, a huge uh, discrepancy between the rate of the credit growth and uh, industrial production. So in fact, credit was driving uh, to a large extent the economies. What does it mean from the perspective of sustainability? It was uh, consumption based uh, on uh, future uh, revenues. The whole idea of this model is based on two assumptions. First, that the growth rates would be stable over time and we will have stable increase. So we can borrow now and uh, we will be able to pay back because we will have more money in the future. Just very simplifying, but still the logic is the same. And this is also, by the way, the same uh, logic behind the mortgage expansion and this debt trap into which uh, uh, the many of the US households fell when they were anticipating constant increase in f uh, their wealth based on the appreciation of uh, uh, their assets in terms of housing against which they could borrow more and more. How does it look from the household perspective? This is the mm, uh, second graph and it shows you the value of the uh, long-term uh, loans of the households as percentage of GDP. This is uh, a set of countries from our region, those uh, for which we have uh, relatively robust data. Of course, not all time series are available, but you can see clearly uh, the trend. In the middle of the 90s, until the beginning of the 2000s, uh, uh, the household indebtedness, this is a long-term debt, primarily mortgages or other uh, long-term purchases. Uh, the household indebtedness was roughly around 7% of uh, the GDP. And then it started shooting up and you see dramatic increase, uh, because it is really dramatic to rise from seven roughly to 20 plus, in some cases, uh, uh, like Hungary, close to 30% of GDP. What does it mean? It means that uh, uh, the households were increasingly consuming in future tense. And in fact, this is something which uh, very much resembles the model of the pre-transition pattern when the societies were living in future tense. So this temporal shift of consumption, we were borrowing and consuming now against resources and money, which we will be able, hopefully, to learn tomorrow, I think is very important, and it is part of the uh, explanations, uh, the fundamentals of the crisis, which is still not quite uh, well uh, elaborated. This one is Russia, and this one is Kazakhstan. In fact, in fact all, countries, all countries have uh, uh, declined after uh, 2008, because for obvious reasons, in 2008, the conditions for borrowing were just overnight deteriorated. If, for example, last year, uh, roughly in the summer last year, banks were still uh, going after clients and uh, just trying to uh, persuade to get more loans and mortgages, and uh, now it is not the case. And in fact, it stopped uh, uh, somewhere in September, October, when the first indications of the crisis uh, uh, just came, came to the surface. And this is the, this, this uh, trend which is uh, uh, reflected. I think one of the, one of the uh, interesting cases, uh, cases is Ukraine, and Ukraine is here. Uh, it, starts, it's, it does not mean that it didn't have uh, any uh, indebtedness uh, before 2004, simply we didn't have data for, before 2004. But this step increase, I think, is uh, unprecedented. I think it can be correlated with the uh, uh, current status of the level and the depth of the problems which the country faces. because. Ukraine is one example, Hungary is another example, Lithuania and uh, Latvia are not here on the graph, but they're also in the same more or less uh, pattern. This graph, uh, uh, this graph shows uh, mm, another angle uh, on the issue, uh, again illustrating this uh, uh, hypothesis of uh, borrowed nature of growth, and it summarizes the current account balance. Uh, 
the current account balance is the difference between uh, uh, revenues from exports and uh, uh, imports. And uh, if it is in negative, obviously, we uh, buy more than we sell abroad. Of course, the picture is much more complicated because current account balance, uh, current account deficit is not necessarily something bad. Uh, for example, if uh, there is a, a huge uh, foreign investment in a country and uh, uh, the investor buys a factory, uh, builds a factory, and imports uh, machinery for this factory, it will show uh, in the current account balance as, as, as negative. On the, one, uh, this is on, on, the one, on the other hand, if you have uh, a huge number of uh, people living uh, and earning abroad, uh, labor migration, and they uh, send remittances, they will show up in the current account balance uh, uh, also um, as deficit because uh, uh, consumption based on remittances uh, translates usually into increased imports and uh, it uh, automatically uh, deteriorates the current account balance. The third uh, possible explanation of the current account deficit is related to shadow economy. When you have certain uh, revenues in the country which are not accounted, and on the other hand, they uh, influence, they have impact on the consumption patterns and uh, uh, stimulate imports from, uh, from the population, then it will, uh, then it will automatically uh, also have this negative uh, trend. And you see, if country by country, this is Montenegro. Uh, if you go case by case, uh, in depth in this country context, uh, you have certain explanations. So Montenegro was uh, one of the worst in this case, but Bulgaria was next. And the next is Latvia with Lithuania and with Georgia. So those are the three countries with uh, facing the uh, worst situation in terms of current account. This is the projection. Hopefully it will be like that, but also hopefully in quotes because there are different ways of uh, uh, balancing the current account. You can decrease imports dramatically. You can just, uh, because people cannot afford buying anything, you can increase export, hopefully if you start producing something and start selling abroad and so on. But the picture is also uh, illustrative here because it also uh, suggests that uh, a large number of countries were in fact uh, uh, consuming more than they were producing. And this is one of the explanations, uh, I think, which is uh, worth uh, to be considered of the economic crisis. There is clear difference, clear distinction between two groups of countries, the so-called deficit countries and surplus countries. For example, uh, the surplus countries, uh, Russia is a surplus country, Kazakhstan, which are exporting more, Turkmenistan, more than they, they import, but these are the resource-based uh, exports. Another example of uh, surplus country is Germany, which is heavily uh, focused on uh, export, and in the entire uh, economic model in Germany is very prudent in this regard, so they don't go into uh, this uh, deficit-based uh, and deficit-related uh, economic growth. Typical uh, uh, out countries of our region, uh, deficit country, I think, is the US, which has a large uh, amount of uh, uh, import, which is not covered uh, by export and it's financed uh, through other instruments. Balash will tell more about this, perhaps. And here is also one of the explanations, because at global level, when you see at the difference mm, uh, between surplus and deficit countries, uh, there is a very clear mismatch between, if you say, tell, uh, take China, as uh, we mentioned at the beginning, all this uh, output uh, which was produced in China during these uh, years of uh, tremendous and fascinating uh, growth rates in the last decade had to be absorbed somewhere. One of the uh, sources of China, Chinese com competitiveness uh, was uh, uh, the low level of uh, um, wages and uh, now it is slightly changing but still at the beginning it was the case so where to offload this production it was somehow uh, offloaded in developed economies which were happy to borrow and to uh, in fact uh, shift the burden of earning the money which uh, need to be paid for the current consumption to the future generation in terms of uh, uh, increased uh, uh, debt uh, uh, of the government or in other, in other forms. It can be not in the future generation, it can, be, can take a uh, shorter time span, but to what extent it would be possible, 
it is very much unclear due to the uh, unclarity in terms of uh, internal markets absorption, in terms of uh, possibilities for uh, increasing uh, output of services and goods to offset uh, these deficits. Let's now have a look beyond, uh, have a look, uh, beyond economics. Uh, why? Because uh, what we're talking about was much more uh, GDP related. But uh, as we know, uh, human development is not just uh, uh, the, the consumption of goods and services. And I think the human development aspect of the crisis uh, are still under um, value, valued because uh, their focus is mostly on the outcomes. I mean, we know that, uh, yes, declining uh, GDP, declining incomes would uh, uh, have a negative impact on uh, consumption of people, on the possibilities to meet their needs, and so on and so forth. But I think what is more important, there is, there is a strong uh, argument in favor of uh, the thesis that, uh, in fact, the uh, fundamental causes of the crisis were also human development related because uh, the very set of uh, incentives and disincentives in the uh, current economic system are very much consumption based. So we have this model which is based on the consumption. Uh, consumption is supposed to fuel demand for goods and services. Demand is increasing production. Production is increasing employment. Employment is increasing incomes. But the starting point is consumption. And if you see now, the um, governments, uh, uh, in fact, are focusing primarily on increase of consumption so that to start the uh, economic cycle uh, in motion. But again, we are facing the same problem. Who will buy those goods? Because we all are in dual capacity. On the one hand, we are producers being part of the production uh, side of the equation. But on the other, we are consumers. We are consuming other people and other producers, goods, and services, which are somehow supposed to, to uh, fuel the cycle. And unless we balance the two, uh, two parts, uh, the whole equation cannot be uh, sustainable. And for some uh, certain period of time, it was balanced uh, thanks to the, uh, this uh, uh, credit-based temporal shift. We simply offloaded part, huge part of the, uh, the value produced and generated to somebody else in the future. But the bigger question is uh, the relationship between all this production. Even if we can assume that uh, uh, there is a need and there is a capacity to absorb this uh, uh, production, the link between functionality and capability, which we are discussing, discussing in the uh, human development uh, uh, terms, is, is rather weak, or it's not always clear. Uh, of course, it is very difficult to, to provide quantitative arguments in this regard. Here I would understand, would, would agree that uh, qualitative service would be more, more appropriate. But if you look around and see, uh, ask the question, do we actually need this or that purchase? And to what extent uh, the next round of uh, goods which are being poured into the market are supposed to serve people's needs, and to what extent they are supposed to uh, increase the momentum of the economic cycle, the answer is not that clear cut. And very often, at least, I have the impression, that's, I would be happy if you, if you uh, prove me wrong, but I have the impression that uh, we are increasingly being put not in the role of uh, uh, human beings whose uh, potential needs to be expanded, but as an element of this expansion of uh, uh, consumer demand mechanisms. So we are part of the economic cycle dri driving force and not uh, at the center of the whole uh, process as it is supposed to be uh, from human development perspective. And uh, this is, uh, by the way, interesting uh, uh, because we, we, if you read the uh, articles on this topic and uh, if you follow the, the issue, there is a kind of patriotic duty to shop, if you notice. I mean, we need to go to rescue the economy because otherwise, I mean, it will all collapse, so let's go and shop. I think it is very dangerous from two, at least two, uh, two, two angles. First, it puts uh, the commodity not as a, a necessary uh, means but as a uh, final objective of the whole cycle. And second is the resources sustainability aspect, which I will go uh, talk about uh, in a few minutes. So what are the immediate aspects of the crisis? Uh, we mentioned already the declining living standards. I mean, this is clear. 
Uh, but uh, what is even, even more important, the uh, impact of the crisis is not equally um, uh, distributed among different segments of the population. Uh, to put it simply, the vulnerable populations are more vulnerable than others. Uh, they are first uh, to lose their jobs and they are the last to gain them back, if the jobs are back. Uh, we have uh, indication, as I mentioned, that the post-crisis recovery would be rather jobless than uh, jobful. And uh, uh, for the uh, vulnerable populations, uh, it is uh, increasingly uh, a threat in terms of uh, survival and uh, human security even. Uh, of course, there is uh, another side of the, of the coin, uh, and it is that um, vulnerable are so vulnerable anyway, so uh, they wouldn't experience that magnitude of decline as those who are not vulnerable and going uh, down to, which is of course uh, can be also discussed psychologically or whatever, but the issue is definitely there. Uh, there is huge risk for an increasing number of people who simply will not uh, be able to have access to jobs and incomes. Uh, additional problem related to this uh, relative uh, perception of the decline is a decreasing level of social solidarity. When you have uh, a situation when you were better off yesterday and now you're suddenly uh, losing your job or can, can you lose your job, the, 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 the uh, readiness to uh, devote uh, your attention and somehow to be uh, helpful or uh, merciful or whatever to somebody who is in a worse situation is, is uh, relatively declining. And we are witnessing this also in uh, our countries in Central Europe in uh, the context, for example, of the ratio to Roma population. There is uh, uh, the, the slowly gaining trend uh, of uh, increased uh, tendency to exclude and to disregard the plight of uh, those who are weaker than you in market terms. And uh, I think this is one of the uh, very dangerous uh, immediate implications which can turn into uh, something much more serious in the long run. The stimulus packages is another, another uh, uh, issue with immediate implications. Uh, simply not all countries can afford stimulus packages. And the stimulus packages, uh, in fact, uh, uh, work in a very strange way. Uh, actually, you never know exactly what would be the impact because the impact uh, it is not related to the national borders anymore due to the global economy. If you, a government, for example, which is very much uh, open uh, to trade, invests in, uh, uh, I don't know, consumption, uh, in, in, in increasing uh, the level of uh, uh, consumption of its population, just assuming for the sake of the example, just giving away uh, money or grants for each household uh, to buy something. The purchases they can do may just uh, uh, stimulate the production of some uh, consumption goods elsewhere because of this uh, uh, globalized uh, links. And uh, also uh, governments being aware of that uh, usually link the stimulus packages to different types of conditionality, so-called uh, economic nationalism. So France is one example, but I think it's not just the only one. Shrinking savings is uh, one of the, one of the uh, big uh, questions here. If you remember, uh, immediately after the crisis began, there was this issue. So, so many pension funds, uh, uh, mutual funds were investing in uh, different uh, instruments, in quotes, and uh, when the uh, bubble bust, uh, the value of those instruments just, just vanished. And the money, which was real money invested, somehow is not there. And uh, on the one hand, it is uh, a real loss and uh, there were real savings of real people which were contributing their pension contributions and uh, uh, lost them. But on the other, it's also uh, the bigger question, I mean, was the money there uh, at all? And how, how is uh, uh, the whole question, where is the money? Uh, addressed. And part of the, it is not an answer, it's illustration of the issue, because it's also something which is very difficult to find quantitative data. Hopefully next year, when we run the course next time, we will be better uh, equipped with data. But this is one quote from a, a promotion website of the UK uh, government uh, services, and uh, uh, it's kind of an investment promotion uh, tool. 
I will read you because uh, it is uh, not very visible. The 33 billion trade surplus in financial services made a substantial contribution to the balance of payments in 2007, up 7 billion on 2006. So from 2006 to 2007, we have 7 billion increase of the in, uh, trade surplus. In 2007, financial services accounted for 10.1% of UK GDP and for 14% of UK GDP when added to associated services. This is something which is very important because it brings us to the uh, next open question, in fact. What is the magnitude of the value lost? Was there any value lost? And how to account for this value? Something which is uh, uh, also debatable, and I think it will be uh, a point of debate for the decades and for the centuries to come, as it, as it is for, for centuries already in economic thought. What is the source of value? Is any transaction which is generating money, making money, is a value? Or certain type of transactions have just redistributive nature and just uh, kind of financial speculation or whatever uh, nature. Not just the Madoff type of uh, Ponzi schemes, but uh, financial intermediation which is linked to uh, some uh, uh, real economic uh, improvements uh, or growth, but very, very loosely and very remotely. I mean, those are two extremes. One extreme is the old Marxist uh, approach that only uh, real sector uh, material production generates value, and the other extreme that uh, any kind of transaction uh, generates value. But between those two extremes, obviously, you cannot just strike a point that this is uh, the point at which financial intermediation stops generating additional value and just redistribute the existing one. But the fact that it is difficult to establish does not mean that there is no such an optimum. and does not mean that certain types of financial services are in fact just uh, uh, a kind of a bubble which are increasing uh, uh, the turnover, inflating the value of GDP because it is accounted in the GDP, but in fact the value is not there. And when you uh, look back, what has uh, been uh, uh, produced or generated, it's very difficult to account. Just two, two simple examples. Uh, maybe you know uh, the term uh, short selling. Do you know what short selling means? Short selling is a, a financial, uh, I would say, exercise, uh, a way of uh, making money on the financial markets when you know that certain stock or expect that certain stock will fall in price in a certain period of time in the future. What do you do? You don't sell it, you buy it uh, or you borrow it from an owner on a certain contract. Then you sell it and uh, when the price falls down below a certain point, you buy it back and uh, give back to the owner. And the difference between the price on which you sold initially and you bought back is a net gain for, for the financial intermediator. I mean, yes, you can, you can assume that this is value generating activity, but it's very, I, I would say, debatable. Another example which I think uh, is very relevant also in macroeconomic uh, perspective is uh, uh, gambling. Gambling is accounted as uh, 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 G G gross value added uh, activity, and it co nominally it con does contribute to the uh, GDP. So the more gamblers you have, the higher GDP you have. It's also an interesting concept. But uh, uh, having said this, it is just an uh, illustration of the uh, overall uh, idea that, uh, in fact, we don't know. At least I don't think we know uh, the real uh, level of inflation, to what extent uh, the values of the GDP estimates were inflated not due to the financial bubble itself, but uh, to what extent is this value which is in fact does not have uh, a kind of uh, counterbalancing uh, uh, real, real economy uh, implications. In our countries, there is a um, second uh, issue which is uh, very much uh, unexplored and uh, at some point, I was trying to do some estimates, but still, it's very difficult to do. Uh, the issue of uh, revaluation of the assets, because at the beginning of transition, 
what we had is uh, uh, the old system entered abruptly into a new economic model. And uh, uh, the assets, I mean, factories, fixed capital, anything, you have infrastructure and so on, were hugely uh, undervalued because they were uh, usually nominal price inflated by certain, uh, in certain uh, uh, coefficients. Uh, this revaluation exercise was done in every country somehow to bring the accounts uh, in line with, uh, with the reality. But what reality, uh, in fact, shows is that uh, uh, the nominal value of the assets was not accounted later in the books and uh, the market value was very much different from that. To give you one example, in most of the countries when the telecoms were privatized, they were privatized with the entire infrastructure uh, around this, not just uh, transmission uh, infrastructure, but also uh, due to the old technological system, there were um, uh, transmission towers with uh, all uh, plots of land, species of uh, forest, whatever. It, you, you, you will be amazed how huge is the uh, asset of a former uh, te telecom uh, company in, in our region. Later, with, uh, with the, infrastructure, with the uh, privatization and with uh, economic reform uh, catching up, part of those assets simply change in nature. For example, if you had uh, a piece of factory somewhere downtown in uh, uh, Budapest, for example, or Bratislava, or whatever, uh, due to the uh, new economy emerging, service-based economy, it, uh, it is already totally different, different type of uh, value, which is accounted indirectly during the economic cycle. It is reflected in the future receipts and the GDP. But in fact, it is uh, something which is uh, uh, very much inflationary uh, type, of, type of increase. So I mean, it is a very sketchy e example. My point is that. Uh, the nominal value of the GDP growth in the region, in our countries, can be lower than we witness. And all these miracles of uh, post-transition uh, increase in uh, GDP growth, I think, can be uh, taken with certain uh, level of caution. So, a uh, few minutes left. What are the long-term implications of all this? First, uh, there is a bad example which uh, was uh, uh, put on the table and it can be followed. The bad example is that uh, uh, we are half uh, way to the uh, ideals of uh, market-based economy because market-based economy assumes individual risks and consequences for these risks. In the f cases of the banking crisis with huge leverage, they, they were, uh, we were not talking about this, but it's also part of the issue. In fact, the risk was there, but the responsibility was, was not. And uh, I think this is a major, uh, a major problem uh, uh, which is related to the crisis. Now, uh, if you see uh, the coverage of this, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, when the banks were stabilized, uh, in, thanks to these huge injections of, of resources, and the system did not collapse because it was too uh, important uh, to call, to just to leave it like that, to collapse. There is a, mm, a trend to rewrite history. Actually, the question, what was the problem? And even we didn't even need this uh, state uh, support uh, at the end of last year and at the beginning of this year. We could survive on our own very nicely. But we had, because we were pressured uh, by the governments, and this is something which had to accept. So this revision of the history, even six months after uh, the, whole things, uh, uh, the whole thing exploded, I think is uh, a major, major problem for the future, because in fact, it has the nucleus of the future repetition of uh, uh, what has been done. Second, there is a uh, very, I would say, worrying trend of state intervention in interventionism. So bringing the state back in uh, an economic, economic sphere is the economic actor. Not so much as uh, an actor in terms of providing security, social uh, uh, safety networks, and so on, but actively uh, influencing the business cycle from the point of view of regulations, from the point of view of direct uh, intervention in terms of uh, financial and other uh, tools. In our countries, I would expect that there will be a huge increase in uh, so-called public works, redistributing uh, uh, taxpayers' money at the end of the day uh, through some state channels for some purposes which are not necessarily uh, relevant from market perspective. 
This uh, uh, already uh, increases the public debt. So again, we are fueling uh, the debt cycle, and uh, again, we will witness uh, another round of uh, indebtedness of the future generations. And uh, uh, here I put it, uh, the end of export-driven model of growth. I think it is something, maybe not the end, but uh, definitely for the uh, short-term perspective, uh, the export uh, cannot be uh, seen as uh, uh, the engine of uh, national uh, uh, growth. Because simply, we don't have uh, uh, efficient demand elsewhere to offload uh, uh, our output. As Paul Krugman put it in his uh, recent lecture in June in uh, London School of Economics, unless we find another planet to export to. So we don't have another planet to export to. But we have this planet based on uh, resources of which we have uh, uh, choices to this or that. And the last slides would be devoted to this. Because the capacity of the ecosystem, as we were discussing last week, is very uh, limited. And uh, we know or less m know uh, more or less this, this capacity to what extent it can be uh, just overshot. I put you several slides. I mentioned this book, the uh, Club of Rome reports, uh, slides on two scenarios. Uh, if you remember this uh, uh, simulation, this World 3 uh, model uh, is operating with several variables which are interrelated, uh, bringing in resources, population, food production, pollution, and industrial output. And the logic is very simple. If you, induce industri if you increase industrial output, you uh, decrease the resources which are non-renewable. If you increase the population, the cap capacity of the plant to produce the needed food is, uh, is limited. So you need either to have certain adjustments in terms of productivity or otherwise. And of course, all this uh, has uh, impact on the pollution and some uh, quality of uh, living standards. This slide shows the state of the world in terms of resources, output, and population pollution. So uh, this is uh, so-called scenario six, which assumes that there will be very huge investment in new technologies, in re reusable uh, energy in, uh, resources, and uh, uh, not uh, so much new resources-based growth, which is the ideal model, but we are far from this. And even in this, in this ideal model, there is a, a very uh, a spike in terms of uh, industrial output, which at certain point uh, uh, needs to go down because of the uh, decreased resources. The same scenario uh, summarizes life expectancy, consumer uh, life expectancy in this line, consumer uh, goods and services this line, and uh, food uh, per person is this, this line. The overall uh, conclusion of the scenario that it can bring the Human Welfare Index, by the way, it was similar to Human Development Index philosophy, but from the middle of the 70s, the Human Welfare Index and ecological footprint back to some kind of normal uh, affordable limits uh, uh, by the year 2050. As you see, the projections suggest certain spike in this uh, regard uh, in uh, around 2020 and uh, a uh, slow decline uh, in terms of economic, ecological footprint uh, after, after this period. But there is another scenario, and this is the scenario which we are now, still. It is a scenario based on uh, additional bringing in uh, non-renewable resources and uh, less uh, uh, weight on renewables and uh, environmentally friendly uh, management of uh, what we have. And if you see the uh, curve of... Uh, 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 consumer per person and the services spikes below uh, out of the graph because in fact it is something which is very much related to consumption. If you have uh, this current patterns of consumption more or less it will behave like this. But it will come at certain point uh, at the cost of dramatic life expectancy uh, fall because of uh, uh, increased pollution and uh, uh, related uh, uh, negative consequences from human life. Why? Because uh, pollution, which is related to the increase of uh, the uh, production based on the old pattern of growth, is going even out of the graph. It's, it, is, it is totally. And industrial output also spikes, but uh, due to the uh, depletion of resources, it gradually, uh, drastically falls uh, uh, after the 2050. This is, of course, a set of models. Uh, the, the second model uh, with human welfare index and ecological footprint. And you see this mismatch, huge ecological footprint in terms of pollution. Here is where we are more or less now, so twice as bad as it is now. <laughs>
I don't think we can imagine because nobody can imagine how it uh, will look like, but it is just illustration. The bottom line is there are different options. So depending on what option we take, we will have different outcomes. And uh, I think one of the major, uh, major issues related to the financial economic crisis is uh, say restoring the commodity functionality and the capability chain. At the end of the day, the name of the game is increasing people's capabilities, not the number of uh, uh, goods and services. This is not the objective. This is just the means to increasing uh, uh, the opportunities for better choices and better lives of people. And for that purpose, I think what is still not quite uh, well understood is that just restoring the uh, pre-crisis levels is not enough and it will not work. So a kind of uh, radical paradigm shift is necessary. Uh, last Monday we had uh, a lecture by Jens and who was uh, uh, talking about uh, the green economy and all the related issues. This is, I think, not just for the sake of uh, greening uh, uh, the pattern of uh, growth, but it is uh, a kind of introduction to new conceptualization of uh, what we're facing now. Unless we uh, put ourselves in a different box and get out of the existing uh, uh, limitations of the standard approaches, let's increase GDP, let's increase employment, let's save industries like, for example, car industry or whatever, it will not work. This is, one, by the way, one of the, one of the trends which we are already uh, experiencing and facing in, in Europe, for example. There are huge programs in uh, uh, developed economies to promote uh, exchange of old cars by new cars, to, to uh, uh, fuel the, supply, uh, so the, the demand for, for the new production and somehow un unblock the economic cycle, which I think is totally, totally um, in, the wrong way to go. And what is interesting thing, at least in Slovakia, I don't know what about uh, Budapest, I don't understand the language, but in Slovakia you see the same shredding of uh, old uh, items approach applied already to other goods. You can go and bring the old pair of your shoes and get a new uh, pair uh, as a kind of promotion of consumption pattern. You can do the same with your old uh, computer and your old uh, vacuum cleaner. So. This buy-buy-buy uh, 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 type of mentality with patriotic duty of shopping, I think, is something which is very dangerous in the long run. And uh, I think the approach to the financial system, uh, there is a need of uh, reconceptualization. I, I don't have the answers. I don't think even uh, uh, anybody has the answers. But the problem, I think, is there. And we need somehow to see uh, what is the real role of the financial systems, going beyond the uh, type of scandals and Ponzi schemes. How does the financial system act? How uh, it uh, contributes to those bubbles? What are the mechanisms in which those bubbles translate into real uh, threats to the, to the economy and to the societies? I think this, uh, I'm afraid we're still far from uh, there. And of course, uh, adequate uh, assessment of the scope of the uh, bubbles, how much GDP and the other indicators were inflated due to this or that reasons. I think this is something which is still to come. And last but not least, uh, uh, adequate prices, uh, pricing of inputs. Uh, at this point, uh, and perhaps we will talk about this tomorrow during the environmental session, in fact, the prices mechanisms are not put right. They are not factoring in all the uh, impact on the environment, not just the energy, but also uh, depletion of resources, on renewables, impact on livelihoods, and so on. Which means that any choice based on this uh, uh, set of uh, pricing uh, cannot be adequate either. So unless we put the pricing right, we don't have uh, any kind of opportunities uh, to uh, make the correct, uh, to provide the correct answers to the existing challenges. And that's it. I think. Uh, uh, there is uh, still to come uh, in terms of uh, economic crisis. Uh, hopefully, I will be wrong because I really be believe that uh, the worst is still to come. But uh, maybe it's my East European uh, pessimistic uh, <laughs> type of negativistic view, view of the world. So I'll be happy to hear your views about this. Any questions and comments, and then we'll move on. Please. So basically, uh, uh, it shows the percent of the um, 
of the GDPs in terms of the world economy or what? Because I kind of expected to see advanced economies at the top and you know emerging markets at the bottom. But uh, so I wasn't sure why the why the advanced because economies most of, were because most of the growth uh, rates come in the, uh, from the emerging markets. I mean, those are the markets which has higher growth rates. And all the way during the transition uh, period and the last decade, they were growing faster in terms of growth rates. The advanced economies were growing slower, of course, uh, from a lower base. This is important. This mm -hmm. is rates. OK, so and it's the, not the, the kind, kind of like the, the total in within the... Uh, the total is the blue line. OK. This is... Uh, with with, with uh, emerging markets growing uh, roughly between uh, uh, six and eight percent, I mean China growing around ten percent, uh, the the advanced economy is growing roughly around two three percent, and uh, the average of the world is between four and five percent annually. Oh. Okay, and uh, so then uh, again uh, another question about the same slide. Looking at how. Uh, uh, you know, looking at, look at the bottom part, it look, appears that the advanced economies were actually hit the most than, you know, the emerging economies. Yes, Is because... The, am I correct interpreting it? Exactly. You are correct because uh, uh, the decline in uh, emerging economies uh, is uh, cushioned to, to a large extent by uh, the capability of their internal uh, demand. For example, India and China have uh, a lot of uh, internal market which is not yet uh, saturated. So they can have uh, part of the outputs uh, directed uh, uh, into their internal markets. With uh, the developed uh, economies, it's much, much more difficult uh, to achieve, simply because to put, it, to put it in a kind of, in, in quotes, uh, people in developed economies have already bought their washing machines, cars, telephones, uh, two cars, and so on and so on. That's, that, that's the constraints uh, provided by the, by the uh, demand side. And the demand is still there in the emerging. And that's why the emerging economies are usually seen and the possible answer to the equation that uh, they will be uh, the future market where the future output can be uh, directed. The, there are two problems related to this, that uh, still uh, the level of uh, effective uh, demand in terms of uh, capability to, to buy goods and services is low due to the low level of savings there. And uh, relatively low incomes, uh, maybe apart from China on average. And the second is the resources. If you have uh, uh, the same pattern of growth in uh, uh, the developed, uh, developing economies and emerging markets following the patterns of consumption as in the developed economies, the planet won't, will not last more than 50 years from now. Please. Andre, you, you know that expert-oriented strategy is one of the very efficient uh, strategies of economic growth, and it was um, followed by new industrialized countries of South East, uh, East uh, Asia, uh, and you said that uh, now it's the end of expert-driven model of growth. So what do you propose instead of it? Thank you. I don't know. I think even Paul Krugman doesn't know the answer. Uh, no, it's really, I think it's really fundamental, a really fundamental question. And uh, the, the qu actually, the question is, uh, first, is it indeed the end of uh, export-based uh, model of growth? And. Uh, uh, second, if not, what can be the, the alternative? Uh, actually, I think it is not exactly the, uh, r the right question. I think the real question is, uh, what is the sustainable growth rate which we can afford? And then comes uh, the second question, how uh, it is related. It can be related to export orientation or internal uh, orientation. I, I don't, don't know the answer to the second, but uh, I'm afraid that one of, the, one of the consequences of the crisis would be um, reconsideration of the globalization uh, as a global pattern of uh, producing and exchanging goods and services. Global trade is declining. 
but uh, it is not quite clear to what extent it would be uh, more longer term or just short term uh, uh, decline. And uh, the issue of sustainability of growth is uh, very much uh, linked to this export uh, or non-export oriented. So I don't know. Yes, please. Your, um, even though you're cynical, I think that your presentation was ultimately very optimistic, as I'm not sure of the tendencies of governments to integrate these principles, especially when they're dealing with the immediacy of a crisis. I deeply believe in the local level uh, growth, and it is related to the issue of sustainability, but uh, I, mean, I believe as hoping that it will be. Because it's very, it's very, on the one hand, it's very, uh, very weird that uh, you uh, ruin, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, local livelihoods, uh, moving or somehow encouraging or pushing, whatever you name it. Uh, different countries, it was different. People from their livelihoods into big cities and uh, providing them there with employment, which then this employment uh, produces certain output which needs to be offloaded somewhere. So the whole cycle which is supposed to improve the uh, quality of life of people is a little bit uh, questionable now. Of course, it is in historical perspective, cities uh, were a major driver of uh, uh, improving uh, people's livelihoods and the quality of life. And this, is, this is clear. But I think now with the new technologies, you can shortcut this and uh, have uh, uh, improvement in quality of life in uh, uh, comparable uh, ways uh, to the uh, way it is in, done in the cities without necessarily having the cities. And, uh, uh, but to what, extent, to what extent it is uh, related to local infrastructure? Uh, to what extent it is related to the uh, services which you can provide? There is a mix between, uh, for example, short-term interventions which can be applied in improving those infrastructures so that life of people is somehow comparable without uh, flocking them into cities. I mean, this is a huge, huge issue around there. And uh, uh, it is correct, but at least uh, at this point, I have not uh, seen really a uh, fundamental uh, survey or fundamental research which says, yes, uh, we should not be focusing on uh, saving the big cities with all their slums and so on, and let's focus on uh, redirecting our attention and effort in local economies. Maybe it's still to come. Yes, please. Question mine is that, uh, what was the concept of Madoff's fraud? I think, how did he, uh, I mean, how did he manage? And uh, which were the consequences? And, and uh, how did it influence on current financial crisis? And was the fraud an example of short selling? There is an interesting, I, again, maybe it's my uh, cynical East European uh, uh, proneness to kind of, um, uh, conspiracy theories, but I was wondering why the Medef uh, scandal was revealed uh, exactly now. I mean, people knew about this uh, quite a long time before, and uh, I wonder, I, I don't say it is, but I wonder, wasn't it just for the sake of drawing attention from the financial fundamentals of the crisis? So we have this bad guy, Medef, uh, with uh, uh, Ponzi scheme and so on, but all the rest, all the financial uh, sector is pretty okay and the bankers are trustful and so, so on and so forth. So, for. so at least it, to me it looks like that. Uh, uh, to tell you frankly, uh, I, uh, I, know, I know quite a lot of bankers actually and I know quite a lot of investment bankers and uh, uh, I know some of uh, uh, this new generation of city UPs which came uh, back to Central Euro European countries to run their economies. And uh, frankly, I don't trust them. Simply, their conceptual uh, and value uh, framework is, uh, is rather strange to me, to put it mildly. And uh, uh, in this case, I don't think there is a fundamental difference uh, between uh, the kind of med of, med of type of uh, behavior and uh, some of this, not all, but uh, some of this investment banking and this financial intermediaries uh, type of behavior. The scale is different. The open, uh, because there, there is a different when you, when you borrow money knowing that you're just running a Ponzi scheme and uh, you, you know what is Ponzi scheme, it's pyramid schemes, right? We all had it in our countries. 
I think none of the countries escaped this. When you are inviting uh, three more people, promising that uh, they will get miracles and their installments, they bring an additional three and so on. The first, and the end of the pyramid just collapses because uh, the first uh, got, got, the, got the, the rewards. This is, in a very nutshell, uh, the idea of this. I mean, this is the extreme case. But between the extreme case and uh, the rest, there is no kind of uh, rift uh, which is dividing them. I think fundamentally, conceptually, they are more or less uh, the same, uh, very, very close. But simply, the, the mm, differences uh, in terms of nuances, in terms of scope, and open or uh, legal breaking of the law, breach of the laws, which in fact is uh, in the case of the uh, method type. Uh, scandals. But if you look about uh, this from a different perspective, these value-added things and benefit from the societies, I very much wonder where is the limit, where is the border. Short selling is just one instrument which uh, uh, the same, I mean, similar instrument is uh, the whole repackaging in these new derivatives and uh, uh, selling new instrument, financial instruments. And the problem here is, uh, the beauty of the, here is that uh, it is not so clear cut. On the one hand, you can blame the new derivatives uh, for being an instrument for the, uh, promoting this risky behavior and draining savings and so on and so forth. But on the other, they are very uh, powerful financial instruments uh, for mobilizing resources, for providing access to financial services. So it's, you know, it's like, uh, like a uh, nuclear uh, weapon or nuclear energy. It can be a weapon, it can be something uh, peaceful. So it depends how you use it. So it's very much uh, value-oriented. And uh, uh, that's why I say that uh, uh, the very ethos of the, of the sector, I think, is problematic. Uh, that anything you can do is uh, justifiable simply because you're not breaching the formal law. So some kind of human principles of human development uh, architecture is not there. You know, unless it is missing, then it, is, uh, it becomes something which is not just hollow from human development perspective, but uh, detached from some kind of basic uh, human values. Okay, thank you very much.